Hello everyone, welcome back to My Hero Academia Podfix. This will be the continuation of Research to Rescue. This will be Part 7, Chapter 7, entitled Decide Which Breaks to Cut, But There Will Still Be Blood. Whose Will It Be? Izuku didn't really know why he gave Hiriyama his name, especially right after a conversation it had no place in, and his less than casual attempt at ducking away from answering the question. It didn't do anything other than give him direct links to Izashi. If Hiriyama had a recording device on him, then Izuku's name was now on record. Rabbit's identity was public, to a degree, but it was better than nothing. At least someone outside the dire knew who he was, and at least someone other than Hizashi, Yukio, or Korra knew he wasn't just the rabbit. He was pretty sure the only other person in the world who knew his name was his mother. Maybe the Bakugos, too, if they even bothered. It was such a small victory, being known, that Izuku wasn't sure it was an actual victory, more like a bittersweet participation ribbon. Hiriyama's advice, though, thinking of that problem and comparing it to his current problem, nothing was specific and put into total perspective, but he had his answer. He may not like it. He didn't really like any of the answers he was stuck between, but it was there. The question now was if he had the guts to actually do it. Izuku stopped at a corner store before going into the base to give his mission report. Once Rabbit had said his name, Tsukuji had immediately gotten someone to look into it find whatever they could on the boy, Midori Izuku. All the while, he'd had a terrible feeling he knew that surname. It was somewhat common, yes, but there was a feeling it was closer. Later that same morning, the file was on his desk and a pit was in his stomach. Of course. Of fucking course. Midori Izuku, born to Midori Hazashi and Midori Inko. Birth date, July 15th. Midori Hazashi was divorced not long after the child was born. Midori Inko continued to live with her son, Izuku was diagnosed quirkless at age four. Custody of the child was switched to Hizashi once the boy turned six, for unlisted reasons. After that, it was blank. Midori Izuku had no other records, no doctor's visits, no school enrollments. It seemed he was dropped from his primary school right after the switch. Not even a criminal record existed. He dropped off the face of the earth completely, only to re-emerge as an assassin. The kid was currently 14 years old and missing years' worth of files and records. There was no way to gauge his current health. If he was sick or vaccinated accordingly, it was worrying, definitely. Suguji definitely decided to dig more into Inko's files, which led to no criminal record whatsoever. She was plain and normal with a weak telekinesis quirk. Normal job, normal apartment. She was of no significant note. That is, except her name changed three years prior. She was Yagi Inko now, married to Yagi Toshinori. That was where Tsukuji gave the biggest sigh he'd ever done. Tsukuji knew. He just knew the kid was closer than he thought. He was his closest friend's stepson. He even met Inko a few times in recent past, a wonderful woman, really. The only other hint that she'd had a previous marriage was a few pictures of a young child on the walls and mentions of having a kid who lived with her ex-husband. Did Toshinori know about Asuku? Was the whole custody thing some kind of trick, a cover-up? What had Inko been saying to friends when they asked about him? The logical conclusion here was an interview with her. And that's exactly what a tired Tsukuchi did later that day. Inko's day off, thankfully. He was perfect for asking questions like this with his lie detective quirk. Within the day, he was seated at the dining table with a cup of tea between his hands across from a small Inko. Toshinori beside her, somewhat wary as Tsukuchi suddenly had an unplanned call, and request to speak with Inko in person. Tsukuchi had a tiny thought in his head, asking how he should justify asking these invasive questions, without revealing too much. Now, Masa, Toshinori started after a few minutes of casual talk, of the weather and work. As much as we enjoy having you here, why so sudden a visit? Tsukuchi did his best to make his answering sigh sound unburdened. According to Inko's slightly worried expression, it didn't work as well as he hoped. I've been working on an important case, revolving around some very dangerous people. Names have come up, and I needed to ask you, Inko, if you knew anything about them, if you wouldn't mind. Immediately, Inko's face filled with more worry and confusion than Tsukuji had ever seen her with before. She nodded and said a soft, of course. Holding her tea tighter in both hands, Toshinori was giving Tsukuji a wary look. You were previously married to a Midori Hazashi, correct? Inko paled. We divorced not long after my son was born. Your son? His name was Izuku, correct? Another nod from Inko. Where is he? Do you know? 
Minko seemed hesitant when she said, Hizashi had custody. I haven't had contact with either of them since they left. This may sound out of line, but did you want Hizashi to have custody? Toshinori had an unreadable expression. Inko put a hand on his arm as if she sensed his emotions already. Yes? A lie. Inko. Tsukuchi practically told her he caught the lie. Inko sighed and held her cup with both hands again. Toshinori put a hand on her shoulder in comfort. No, I didn't. I didn't have much choice in the matter. Izashi is very persuasive when it comes to things he finds important. Why did he want Izuku after being gone? Now Tsukuji was worried. The kid had given plenty of evidence something was wrong. Aizawa would be able to tell even more because he was actually there and could read expressions and body language. All Tsukuji had were audio recordings. Inko took a few moments to think of an answer. She cast a look around the apartment and sighed after she had figured out what to say. Her eyes lingered on an oddly colored patch on the floor behind the couch, or she was looking for just a second longer than anything else. I don't know. Hisashi runs with his own ideas and doesn't let anything stop him. I could never talk him out of his plans and ideas. It makes him dangerous. He was dangerous to Izuku. Didn't like him for some odd reason. He never explained. So I got a restraining order and divorced him to keep him safe. It was the truth. Then Inko looked directly at Tsukuji right in the eyes. Is, is this about Izuku? She had a tone of hopefulness mixed in with dread, and Toshinori straightened slightly as Tsukuji looked over at him and sighed again. He was doing that a lot these days. It is. Information is still new and very, very little. We're unable to disclose it. The case is still ongoing. We're currently trying to figure out more about him, the connection to the case, and his exact location. Is there anything you can tell us about him? Toshinori was the one to ask, while Inko seemed to be processing. Understandable. Tsukuchi had just admitted he knew vaguely where her son could be. Tsukuchi shook his head. All we can disclose is that he's in a very delicate situation, but he's alive. That's all I can say. Apologies. No, no, that's... that's fine. Inko started. She gave a wobbling smile that felt like genuine hope and a form of relief. Tsukuchi didn't really know where to go from there. It was a mess that Aizawa was left to untangle. He wished that he could write it all out, but that'd just be stupid at this point. Plus, it was late. He should be asleep, and he didn't have any paper to write on anyways. His mind would have to do with making his theories quietly. So, basics. Midori Hazashi ran the Silver Dyer. Rabbit was an assassin for Silver Dyer, expected to have started working at eleven. Rabbit was most likely under a threat from Hizashi if he stayed and endured whatever Hizashi was doing. All easy and quick to understand. However, Rabbit's real name was Midori Izuku, and assuming he'd kept it a secret for a reason, it probably meant the kid was Hizashi's son. So why the fuck would Hizashi do all of this to his child? To any child? What was there to gain? He'd have to walk on eggshells now. Something seemed so off. Why would Rabbit tell him his name if it wasn't? Why ask the question he did? The kid was clever and seemed to choose his words carefully. Aizawa frowned at the ceiling. Something was going to happen. He didn't know what, but if he didn't find out it soon, then... Well, Aizawa didn't want to think on what could happen. Izuku probably should have learned that if he really hoped for something, it didn't happen. So his wish to have times to think things over was dead before dawn. He had his reports written up, even one for Hirayama, but was told to leave them in his room before the meeting with Hizashi. They weren't needed. Izuku found out why when he stood to the side of the meeting room near Hizashi's chair, looking down at a long wooden table at the two rows of hackers, as Izuku called them, sandwiching the table with Kora at the very end. Hizashi at the head of the table with his hands bridged over the table as well. Izuku wasn't in uniform for once. It was his day off, until stated otherwise— standing in black jeans and a dark turtleneck, watching the room straight-backed and almost blending into the dark walls. Hirayama Masato, Cora started. She was holding a report, someone else's that was neatly typed and printed, unlike Izuku's messy handwritten ones. Age 32, quirk of an erasing variety, hired mid-December. He was a part of the mission in Hosu with Rabbit. He passed an assessment with the target killed and papers collected. He has a simple crime history, minimum jail time, six unproven accounts of murder, a hit-and-run on file. He doesn't stand out against any lineup. All his legal documents are forged. Unlike other members with forged documents, his appearance matches nothing else on police record or prison rosters within the time he was claimed to have been locked up. Azashi hummed. 
Rabbit. He looked over at Izuku, who kept his face in a trained, neutral expression. In your own reports, did you find the same things? I was under the impression it was like most of the other members who forged papers. All of them had no connected documents at all. He could be faking his name, and it didn't match any of the prison records because of it. With our program's facial scans, it would match to any and all mugshots or ID photos. Other than the ones provided, there's no match on any system. One of the hackers quipped from the edge of the table. I don't have that program available. I wouldn't know if his scans matched or not. Izuku kept his voice level despite his heart racing. Was it foolish to think Izashi could hear it beating in his throat? The hacker frowned. Do you think he's the mole? Izashi veered the conversation forward. Cora nodded. Then what course of action do you suggest we take? His nail was tapping rhythmically on the table. Cora put the report in her hand on the table as well and looked at Hizashi directly. We monitor him closely, two days. Mole or not, we can't get rid of him before we launch phase one. The surprise must have shown on Izuku's face because Cora frowned. Is something the matter, Rabbit? No, no, I was just wondering, if he isn't the mole, why waste time killing him instead of directing resources to find the real one? Especially with the current timetable being so specific, there's not really any time to waste on a fruitless task like this. It sets an example, Izashi said before Cora could. Make the real mole know we're on their trail. They'll panic and scramble. It'd be easier, much easier to find where they hide when they do. Isuku nodded and kept quiet, watching Cora and Izashi talk, the same circles he didn't want to hear. Yukio walked in to start discussion on something else, and Izuku was dismissed. He was quick to leave and go the direction of his room. He grabbed the three USB sticks from under his dresser where he stored them when he got home that night, grabbing his backpack, stuffing his dire notebooks inside, under his rabbit hoodie, and leaving with it secured on his shoulders. Izuku beelined for the labs, knowing the technical team would be away from the offices as they perfected last-minute weapon production for Phase 1. Now was the perfect time to put his shitty half-baked plan into action. If he disappeared, no one would really notice was what he thought as he slipped into the first office and started to quietly go through the desks, searching for paper files for anything before he went for the computer, locating a USB drive and plugging it into the computer to look through it. His thoughts sounded pretty suicidal to any outside source. Hell, it sounded suicidal to him. If any respectable adult heard him even mutter such a phrase, he'd be thrown into counseling immediately. Izuku frowned. The USB was subject files. Izuku disconnected it and stuffed it in his backpack under the hoodie and kept looking, moving to the file cabinet. It was true, though. Izuku hadn't really existed since he was six. Not on paper, at least. He had no relationships outside of the dyer. Iriyama could be counted as the dyer until Izuku could confirm he was a racer head. And no connections anywhere else. Well, maybe there was his mother, but Inka was already missing him. Maybe she even thought he was already dead. It didn't count. Izuku found two more USBs on weapon production and stashed them away before slipping into two more lab offices after. Finding more specifics on the weapons and three maxed-out USBs on the quirk grafting. Then he went for cores. Once this information was turned into the heroes, the dyer would find out not long after, a few hours at best until they realized something was stolen. They were good at that. He'd then be dragged back to the main base and executed the way all traitors were. Two full days of torture, one if the crime was severe enough. Marked as a traitor, any loved ones executed and then finally killed however Hisashi saw fit which depended on so many variables that one had a better chance of winning the lottery than being granted a merciful death. After that, Izuku never cared to learn what happened to corpses. That process was only one Izuku had heard happening and never actually seen. It didn't sound fun. Torture never did sound fun, and he didn't want any part of it, but his current plan barreled straight towards that end result with no other options to aim for. That was his reward for going through with this, though it could be altered considering Izuku was going to have one hell of a crime. Willingly hiding a mole, passed on enough information to incriminate and incarcerate every living dire member three times over, and let the mole go without even a paper cut, he'd be in for so much hell that he'd be facing death right after he gave the backpack over. Keel over and just go. He wouldn't, though. Going back could buy some precious time, a distraction as they tried to gauge out exactly how Izuku would fuck them over. Taking the paper files on phase one was easy. Taking copies of her computer file maxed out on one USB stick, then he headed towards the ultimate office, Hizashi's, which required slow movements and a beeline for the computer. Hizashi didn't bother with keeping paper files in his office. That was Cora's responsibility. He was careful not to nudge or touch anything and made a mental note of where the mouse was. 
before turning the computer on, leaning over the chair to do so. Izuku's plan was a combination of all of Hiriyama's options and a few new ideas for flavor. Keep Hiriyama secret, keep Inko safe, make sure everyone lived. He'd make sure of it. If Inko died because Izuku played hero, it'd haunt him for the rest of his pathetic life. He needed the security that she'd be safe. If she wasn't, this was a loss and he'd die for only half of the reasons he planned to. The plan was to give Hiriyama heads up on his absolute death if he went back to the base, give him all the files that he was collecting, and get him to protect Ingo from Hisashi. Witness protection, whatever it was he had to do. Izuku didn't do everything just for the one person that he trusted to disappoint him. Izuku used his remaining two USBs to take every single file. They were stuffed into his pocket to be transferred into the backpack later as he shut everything down the way he had found it. And he snuck out. Then he was gone, out of the office, out of the base, and out of the city, heading right for where Hiriyama's theft job was, hoping to run into him before he committed the crime. The streets were busy for a Wednesday afternoon. Sometimes, Izuku would dream he was a real hero, with a quirk that was 100% his own, not the ones he was forced with, not ones that hurt with each day and made him cough blood if it was used, beating up villains, saving people, doing good things instead of bad ones. He would be helpful, a joy to be around. Worth something, his skills of meaning and use to everyone. He'd make mistakes, he'd be too slow sometimes, and make up for it by saving more. A symbol, a peace-bringer, just like All Might. It was the dreams he'd had as a little kid. Then he'd wake up, remembered the blood soaked into his gloves and making his hands disgustingly warm. Remember the things he'd seen, the things he'd done. He'd blink, and the faces of the victims would haunt the very darkness behind his eyelids, Wide, glassy eyes of all colors, sounds they made as they tried to cling to life and failed, usually some expression of horror and fear twisting their mouths until their faces fell into neutrality. Normally they did. Not all of them had the luxury of appearing at peace when they died. Izuku dodged a rude woman who saw him and bumped his shoulder hard in a silent aggravation. Izuku frowned and kept weaving through the crowd to the train. Sitting on it for the short ride he had to take, using the brief moment of stillness to take the USBs from his pocket and stuff them into the, the hoodie that he had on. Pausing as he was going to close it to look down at the brown stained sleeves of the green jacket, letting reality set in even more than it had. Today, Midori Izuku, the rabbit, was going to break the one deal he had with his own personal devil. He'd become a nameless, forgotten one-trick hero, for only a moment. Handing the credit for his actions over to whoever grabbed it first, he didn't care who took the shiny gold star sticker for the best job done with this information. No, Izuku just wanted to load the gun and aim so someone else could pull the trigger on the dire. As he did, he'd be taking out all of the villain underground's biggest assassins by himself. He was going to kill the rabbit and watch hell crumble around its handler. Even though the backpack had the paper files, a bunch of USB sticks, and a hoodie, it was heavy. Well, of course it was heavy. Paper normally was in stacks, but it was heavier than it should have been. The straps dug into his shoulders, and he was hyper-aware of the bobbing it did, with a heavier step going up the stairs of the train station. Could it be Azuka's fear and worry manifesting itself into the backpack, too? Possibly. It was too late to turn back and pretend this didn't happen. Even if he decided not to go through with this, Hizashi would still kill him for stealing so much from the dyer. More specifically, stealing from Hizashi directly, under his very nose. Accuse him of giving the information out anyways, even though all of it would still be in the backpack. If Izuku couldn't find the hero, he'd go to the police station himself, and then he'd go back and accept his fate. Hizashi would know that he'd done wrong the second he got even a block close to the police station without permission. It's why his routes were usually planned, unless the alert said otherwise. He somehow always knew if he was close to one, though the how was still a mystery to Izuku that he would never solve. Hiriyama's messy bun and gruff outfit stood out to Izuku's eyes. He sped up his walk to beside the adult and spoke only after he double-checked it was really him. He wasn't paying attention to the world around him, or maybe Izuku had just snuck up on him, but it was Hiriyama for sure. Izuku took a quiet breath and stole everything he had for a face of confidence, like he was totally competent in his actions and words and not scared for his life. You get to ask five big questions, and I have to answer truthfully, Izuku started. Hiriyama practically leapt from his skin and stopped walking, a hand on his chest and staring wide-eyed at Izuku, and the boy had stopped and stared back. In return, you do me two favors, no arguing. 
Hirayama took a moment to process fully what Izuku offered and frowned. Don't joke around, kid. Oh, I'm not joking, Izuku stated, matter of fact, a look on his face to match the tone. Really? Really, really? There was silence as the world buzzed around them. Hirayama eventually turned a single thoughtful note out and sighed, stuffing his hands in his coat pocket. Two favors. Can't be everything you want from me. It is. I'm not going to ask you to do a job for me or anything. It's really basic tasks. Easy peasy. Isn't difficult at all, I promise. Izuku glanced around and started his route to the park entrance across the street. Hiriyama glanced at him, at the route he was taking, and followed along. They walked in silence until they reached a third of the way through the park. The park was much less busy on a cold weekday. Little kids played on the playground with their mothers hovering in a group by the benches, occasionally glancing over at their kids before continuing their gossip. I assume you'll be honest? Hiriyama phrased it like a statement, but Izuku wouldn't have counted it as a question. 100% Scout's Honor Izuku made an attempt, a feeble one, at the American Boy Scout salute, something he only did because he'd seen people joke about it and he was trying to make the mood lighter. Hiriyama cracked a smirk before shrugging and tilting his head up slightly to look at the gray clouded sky, Izuku keeping pace beside him. First question. Your name is Midori Izuku, Hiriyama started. Is Midori Hazashi your father? I wish he wasn't, but yes, he's my biological father, Izuku said as he hopped on a small ledge and started to walk on it, arms out to keep his balance as the small brick line became a hill lining the park path. He walked with his feet at Hiriyama's shoulder level. Hiriyama hummed something in thought, a flat note that acknowledged the answer, that he wasn't happy with it. Second question. How long exactly have you been with the dyer? Hmm. Izashi took me from my mother on my sixth birthday. Exactly on that day. I've been under his care ever since. Izuku made a point to use air quotes on care. Before you start wondering, Hizashi told me when I turned ten right before he made the note-taking offer. That was a long time ago, though, and I started being rabbit not long after. Only real lead I have when it comes to my age. Hiriyama's pace didn't stop, but it slowed slightly. Izuku matched it. Third question. During the stakeout mission, you said you were diagnosed quirkless, but right now you have a pretty strong quirk for your age. How do you have it? That was a million-dollar question. Izuku had shifted at the question, slowed down slightly with a look of discomfort on his face. It was easy for Aizawa to see from this angle. The kid's arms drew closer to the grips on the straps of his backpack, which seemed fuller than Aizawa had seen it before. For a moment, Aizawa feared that he asked the wrong question, crossed some sort of unspoken line, but Rabbit allowed him to ask anything. Aizawa was only doing what was asked. It... Hmm. Izuku had trouble finding his words, looking around at the bare trees and dead grass for letters and sentences that his mind wasn't making. His lips pressed into a thin line and thoughts were flashing on his face far too quickly for Aizawa to read. Aizawa took the moment to take the kid in to check for new damages. The cut on his face had scarred right over his nose, the bandages around his neck had been changed to cleaner ones, and probably went over his chest, maybe an arm. He didn't know the extent of this injury, for saving that kid, but it had been there since the stakeout. There weren't any new injuries that he could see over the turtleneck and hoodie, though. To clear everything up beforehand, I don't have a quirk, I have three. Aizawa stopped walking immediately, and Izuku did too. The kid looked to the hill on the other side of the ledge, and he was stuffing his hands in his jacket, single pocket, avoiding Aizawa's face. Two and a half, technically. Fire breathing isn't a fully formed quirk. It hurts when I use it. Why, you saw me coughing up blood after I... I burned in genium. The other two are completely artificial. The technical team works on weapons and quirk development. They specialize in training regiments to strengthen individuals' as quirk for battle and stealth, things like that. They have, or had, I don't know, a sub-project they called Quirk Grafting Project. I was a subject, until my quirks took form. Izashi put me in training, and the note-taking started. Eventually he made me, you know, that. Once I had control, it's why I have Elemental and Lightfoot, while Hizashi doesn't. I only have his fire-breathing quirk for a very different reason, and I'm not really supposed to have developed it, but can't help it, I guess. Aizawa stared and let it all settle in. Quirk grafting? Artificial quirks? How did he get the fire breathing if it wasn't artificial or part of the project? 
What did an artificial quirk even mean? He had to push those aside, though, guessing that Izuku didn't know most of those answers, or wouldn't talk about them yet. So, personal question. Still counts as four. Why did you choose to hang around me when I got to the dire? I'm not exactly people-friendly. Izuku smiled at Aizawa and started their slow walk again. It didn't reach his eyes like it should have, and held more of a solemn air than any other expression Aizawa had seen him with in recent past. Now that Aizawa thought about it, this kid was pushing amounts of confidence he didn't normally have, making his voice louder and not quiet like usual, keeping his head up and shoulders back, not curling in like he normally did, to try and make himself look small. But despite that pride in his body language and his tone, his face was just... sad. It was sobering, almost, to see a kid with that much. Aizawa couldn't name the emotion on his face. Defeat? Despair? Knowing? It rung alarm bells that Aizawa had to silence to hear these answers. I don't know the answer to that. Not a real one, anyways. Aizawa frowned and Izuku caught the look. But if I were to try and tell you why, it's because you have this... this air around you. Calm. Even when you're mad or frustrated, or even in a battle, it's there. I... I haven't met a person with an air like that since I was with my mom. Yours is different, naturally, but people like that can normally be trusted, I think. In my experience, they can, so I find myself trusting you. A lot. It was a genuine answer, and Aizawa had to let silence sit as they walked and let it process. A calm air, that was it? There had to be more the kid wasn't saying about him. Last question. Aizawa let the silence go a bit longer before he eventually asked the question that had been bugging him. Why do you stay in the Silver Dyer? Isuku laughed. It wasn't happy. It was one note, bitter and sad. Sour, even. Like it was some long-ago memory he was reluctant to share. He did anyways. My mom. Aizawa's eyebrows shot up, and Isuku kept talking. I don't get paid. When I was a kid, Hisashi told me that I had to do what he said. I was his son, and... I was supposed to follow his orders without question, but I guess he wanted assurance. So he said if I didn't do what I was told, he'd he'd kidnap my mom, hurt her just like he hurts me, but worse, so much worse, and then he'd kill her and it'd be my fault. Izuku stopped walking and stared at the ground. I was a kid. I didn't know any better than to say yes. It's why I became the rabbit and took those notes and never ran away or tried to fight him. He gave a bitter laugh again. In all honesty, I'm afraid of what he'd do. Kid, I... She's too nice, Izuku continued before Aizawa could get any farther. And she's forgiving and kind and just wants the best for the people that she loves. She doesn't deserve to die like that because I got the idea in my head that I could actually be a good guy. She deserves to be alive and happy like she is now. Blackmail. Aizawa should have guessed it. Blackmail. It made so much sense. It made his blood boil, though. How old was Izuku when this deal was made? Izashi was a bad guy, but to be as low as to threaten a child with their own mother's well-being? With their own mother's life? Izashi was a different kind of shitty. He was a shitty coward. The kid then crouched down on the ledge and gave Aizawa a dead stare, determination shining in his eyes like a fire. Before I ask my favors, I have my own question for you. He started. Aizawa nodded slowly. Hiriyama, you're the hero eraser head, aren't you? The world felt like it froze. How the fuck, how the actual fuck did this kid figure it out? It felt like a dumb question, considering what he did for the dyer. Isuku got a smug smile, so the answer had to have been on Aizawa's face. He wanted to know how the kid knew exactly who he was, and why that determination was paired with the sadness again. I, kid, how did you... I read people, to the best of my abilities, so I had my suspicions that you were a mole for a while since I met you. You were always... odd compared to other rookies I've met. Also a reason I hung near you and talked so much. On the off chance you were recording it, I could get Hisashi in some hot water. I figured out that the eraser had bit maybe a day before the Hosu fight? I'm not sure. Time gets messed up really easily for me. I just wanted to confirm it before I asked you to do anything you couldn't do. And what can I do as a hero that a civilian can't? Aizawa was quick to ask, arms crossed. Izuku smiles again. As always just confirmed the kid was correct, but it didn't feel like that mattered anymore. Izuku was planning something else with the information he had, and Aizawa would be lying if he said he wasn't curious. Hizashi was on to you being a mole, you know. Had us all dig into your files and everything. Cora made a good case this morning to prove you were. 
They were going to monitor you and then kill you right before Phase 1 launched. I know the price for being a mole or a traitor. It isn't pretty, and I'd rather you... you not pay it. I was at odds at what to do about it. Let him kill you, or... So I asked you for advice. You gave me an answer. I just changed it a bit. Gave you an answer? Aizawa laughed. It wasn't a happy laugh. It was a disbelieving one, like he used when Shinso was a kid and did something wrong. Like a drop of paint on a cat by accident, only this time he was more stern. We talked about the trolley problem. You said nothing of any of this. So I have a couple of favors, and you can't waste any time fighting me on them. Kid? Aizawa started, and Izuku silenced him by slipping his backpack off and shoving it into Aizawa's chest. Aizawa instinctively grabbed it in both hands, and Izuku grinned. The look still so fucking sad as he stood up completely and put his hands in his pockets. Take that to the heroes and stop him. What? Stop him. Hezashi. He launches phase one on Saturday and I don't want it to happen. A lot of people will be hurt. How will a backpack... My official jobs for the Dyer were to be rabbit and analyze the heroes. Quirks, informations, fighting styles, how to defeat them in combat, anything a villain might need in order to defeat a hero. It started because Izashi caught me taking notes on the technical team. Just because he had me note-taking on heroes doesn't mean I stopped doing it for villains. Izuku barked a laugh again. There was still no genuine sound to it, though. It's one of the only things I ever went behind his back about. Not sure how I even kept him hidden so long, considering how often the asshole had my room checked. It's dire info. Member info, villains on TV plans, layouts, a gauge for... How many people are in the holding block? As much info as I could gather, and... Izuku shifted. After I got off the train, I bought some USB sticks. Actually, bought is the wrong word. Honestly, I stole them. I didn't have money to buy shit. I was still on the fence about the whole idea, but he announced that you'd be killed, so I, I stole files. Paper files, USB sticks, electronic files, anything I could get my hands on. Info on subjects, phase one and two, the tech team. You know why they left the USB sticks lying in locked drawers? A lot of them. For as smart as they are, they really are a bunch of idiots. Aizawa frowned. Izuku smiled. This one a genuinely pleading smile. No tricks. No lies. It's all there. I just want you to destroy the dire Eraserhead. Take Hizashi's plans and stop them before he gets a chance to launch. It happened Saturday, so you best hurry. Izuku held his arms out in a wide gesture and kept speaking. Bring the whole goddamn empire crashing around his ears and put every last one of those shitty dire members and thugs behind bars. Save all those that they kidnapped and being the silver rain to a final end. Why? His question was stupid. Of course, Izuka would hate silver dire, but wasn't it all he had? He was a part of that mess. A very big part of it. He'd be jailed, too, unless Aizawa could convince Tsukuchi to look for loopholes. Now that was an idea. Izuku dropped his arms and raised an eyebrow at Aizawa. Didn't I make it clear? I hate the dire. I despise it with everything I have. I'm only staying there to protect my mom. If she wasn't in danger, I would have left years ago, before any of this rabbit shit even started. I mean... Izuku lifted his hands in a vague gesture and dropped it so the hit the side of his jeans. Well, I've been in an underground bunker for how many years? I wasn't allowed outside until my first time in a group outing with Yukio. That was my first time as rabbit, by the way. That was a while after Hizashi told me I was ten. I've been with the Dyer since I was six. If I liked it there, I'd have been insane. Izuku crouched down to be more level with Aizawa. Hizashi's a monster. Everything he does is because he wants power. He wants to be a source of suffering and pain for people. He wants to see them squirm and die at his hands. I hate him. More than I hate anything else in the world. Izuku kept eye contact with Aizawa as he spoke. A pit in Aizawa's chest grew deeper the more the kid talked about this. There's only two things in this world that I want. Mizuku held up one finger. Midori Hizashi to be put in a place where he can't hurt anyone ever again. He held up a second finger. And my mother's guaranteed safety. The kid dropped the numbers as he stood up again. This is where my second favor comes in. Aizawa was hesitating when he nodded. This was a switch from the kid he knew. This one had a louder voice. It sounded like he was forcing it to be louder than his usual quiet and spoke clearly. With an unseen confidence Aizawa wasn't sure was really genuine. Despite this, he wanted to hear this request. I was told to never tell anyone, hero or otherwise, about the deal I made to protect my mom. It's why I panicked when all might sign my book, or when Kamui Woods had talked to me after I inserted myself into the sludge villain problem a while ago. It's why Hizashi gets so upset when he finds out I'm close to one, in a fight or otherwise. He doesn't want me to go crying. 
or he doesn't want me to be captured and rat out the sack of shit that he is, but I need this from you. Need what? Aizawa's answer was flat, unlike his currently wild emotions. Izuku's sad, pleading smile was back again. Protect my mom for me. For you? I'm not following Hisashi's orders anymore. That much is obvious, because I told you to ask me questions and I gave you so much info here. I know that I can't do what he says once I started to steal the files. I made my choice. I can't defy him, pay the price, and protect her at the same time. Not by myself. What's the price? I need you to make sure that she's safe until the dire is gone, Izuku continued like Aizawa didn't even speak. Kid, what's... That's all I'm asking of you. Give the heroes the info and protect my mom. Easy peasy. Izuku, Aizawa hissed in his teacher voice, and Izuku stopped talking immediately and frowned at him. What is the price? Izuku was quiet and started their walk again, arms outstretched to keep his already pristine balance. Aizawa reluctantly followed on ground level, eyes trained on the assassin above. What do you think the price is? I don't know. A lie, he knew the real answer. He didn't want to hear it. Hearing it made it real. Izuku gave another cynical laugh. No amusement or happiness, though, to anyone listening in, it would have sounded that way. Aizawa doesn't think he's ever seen the kid actually happy, and every minute that he was growing more sure, though, that Izuku was putting on a confident face in place of something else. It's not nice to lie to kids, you know. Aizawa snapped. I won't let you. Stop. Izuku stopped walking, hands at his sides, and his tone was cold and expressionless. Finality. There's a price to every action someone does, right? Aizawa nods slowly. You cut a balloon string, the balloon floats away. You stay out in the sun too long and you'll get burnt. You fire a gun and a bullet hits a target. You open a window in a rainstorm and your carpet gets wet. You betray the silver dyer. You die. Easy enough a child can get it. Why aren't you? Aizawa's temper flared. Izuku could not be talking about his own death so casually. It was wrong, painful even, to listen to, but then maybe he was only trying to be casual. Izuku was good at putting on an impossible poker face. You can't die. Aizawa hissed. You don't have to go back to that, that shithole. He threw an arm out in a vague gesture to the base that fell to his side a second later. You can go to the station with me. Isuku gave a bitter laugh. We have resources to help you, kid. You can do more than this. There was silence. Please. Aizawa didn't plead very often, but this was a special case. This was a child throwing away his life, sacrificing himself for what? For Aizawa? For his mom? For the people Hisashi's plan could hurt, why did he have to die? What's your name? Izuku. You know mine. It's not fair that I don't know yours. Aizawa. Well, Aizawa-sensei, I'm declining your offer. What? He hissed out, tone angry and harsh. There was hesitance in his eyes, for only a second before it was gone. I'm... The kid paused inside. I'm past the point of being able to. Hisashi always finds out where I am. He knows where I go, everything I do outside the base, no matter what. If I go with you, I'll live on borrowed time, a few hours at most, until he tracks me down. I'll still die. I'll just get more people hurt in the process. Going back myself minimizes the damage, and I planned all of this to get the least amount of people killed. And how many, pray tell, is that? Aizawa hissed. One. Aizawa growled in his frustration. Izuku wasn't listening. He was like a problem student who thought they knew more than the teacher and ended up getting hurt when they didn't listen to instructions. Izuku looked away from the teacher, staring up at the dark, gray, cloudy sky as a chill raced down the path. I'm not worth saving, you know. Aizawa heard this self-deprecating talk from Izuku before, but this was worse. A family with a stroller walked past, father playing with a laughing young daughter, Aizawa didn't look away from Mizuku, even as his scarf blew to his side. A chill ran down his spine, and his bag hit his leg. You know that's a lie. Is it, though? Izuku didn't look at anyone. I've done a lot of bad things. They haunt me, every day, their faces, their voices, their eyes. Most of them I don't know the names of. I'm not allowed to know. Aizawa says nothing and just watches. There isn't anything to miss if I'm gone, either. I don't leave anything behind. I have no actual possessions. I'm disposable to Izashi. Mom probably thinks I'm already dead. No one outside the diary even knows my fucking name. 
Izuku's voice was shaking a bit, and his breathing was uneven and quick. I don't even... His breath hitches. Izuku's shoulders drop. Like his face, his false bravado is gone, and whatever he was really feeling is shining through. From the ground, Izuku looked just... exhausted. More exhausted than a kid his age should be. I don't even have anything of myself to take with me. I don't know my age. I don't know my birthday. I don't remember anything anymore. My mom's birthday, my old school, most of the names of the neighborhood boys I used to play with, names of the bullies that hung around them. I don't remember what it's like to be cold, to not have this this pain in my chest because my quirks don't fit right. Aizawa's heart twisted in his chest when Izuku took in a breath that came out like a dry sob. I've done nothing but hurt people. How many lives did I ruin as rabbit? I've killed people with families, families and friends, people who care about them, who mourned them. Doesn't it matter that they're shitty people? I took away someone people cared about, and for what? To keep Izashi happy and away from Mom? Because I'm too scared of him to tell him no and to just try and run for help. I have no place in people's lives that make them better. I won't be missed like they were. There was nothing to say in the minutes that passed after that. Aizawa could come up with nothing. No reply, no assurance, no comfort. He was just frozen, staring wide-eyed at this kid who believed the lie that he was worth nothing. Heroes don't get to save everyone, Sensei, Mizuku finally said before he looked down at Aizawa. Face somber, his indescribably sad smile on his features and cheeks streaked with cheers, and Aizawa's heart broke. There's innocent people in that base who are worth more than a traitorous murderer. Thunder crashed overhead, and Aizawa's eyes were drawn upward for only a second as the water pelted down. In that second, the kid wasn't standing over him anymore. He was gone. Aizawa didn't even see where he went. The teacher immediately whirled around and looked frantically for any sign of the kid. Aizawa refused to just let him die. A flash of gray and green down the path, and Aizawa practically flew after it, shrugging on the yellow backpack and gripping the straps to his shoulder bag to keep it from bouncing around as he ran. It was fifteen minutes of catching a glimpse of the kid and following it until he was gone completely. Before he knew it, he was standing in the middle of an empty street in a quiet neighborhood, soaked to the bone, cold as hell, and breathing heavy. Water dripped off the strands of his hair, not in his bun, which was on the verge of falling apart and coming undone. His fake glasses had been chucked to the side and abandoned the moment the rain covered them too much to see through. It's not like he needed them anyways. He was alone, and Izuka was gone. Aizawa cursed, a long, loud string of angry words that turned into grumbles as he stalked backwards towards Tsukuji Station. He was going to get these goddamn plans to the detective and go after Izuku himself if he had to. Izuku was not going to die if Aizawa Shota had any fucking say in the matter. Get someone to Yagi's place and bring both of them here now, Tsukuji ordered as soon as Izuku's voice was over the broadcasted signal and admitted that Inka was being used as blackmail. Call the local hero agencies and have them all spare a few workers to go with them. Officers scrambled to follow through with the orders. Tsukuji sat in the office with another hero listening to the broadcast. People listening in usually switched and let it off at night to play back any recordings in the mornings. Right now was active hours. The hero on duty was frowning, and soon Aizawa was cursing. The kid had disappeared. What was this kid even thinking right now? If this was his only option, then he had to be desperate. The hero in the office clocked out, and Tsukuji called Yamada as soon as he heard Aizawa's angry curses start to quiet down. He was there upon the hour, sitting in his office waiting for a racer head to walk in. Listening to the playback as Tsukuji shut off the broadcasting between devices. Aizawa walked in with a look of murder and rage in his eyes. He was no worse for wear, hair stingy and with water and threatening to come out of its bun, and his clothes were soaking. He had a bright yellow backpack in one hand that he dropped in the nearest officer's desk and before he could continue on to Tsukuji's office. There was barely a second for a greeting as Aizawa was already in the open doorway and crossing his office slamming a hand down on the desk hard enough to rattle a water bottle that was sitting on its surface. "'We're going after Izuku,' he hissed, and Tsukuji crossed his arms and leaned back in his chair. "'We already have a plan set up to deal with both problems that we were just waiting for locations. A raid of the bases is going to launch once this Phase 1 business is dealt with entirely. A team was sent out a while ago to get a few heroes and gather Yagi. "'What does Yagi have to do with any of this?' Aizawa growled, and Tsukuji was taken aback slightly by the sheer tone. Yamada was slowly standing from his chair. Aizawa was understandably the most frustrated at this development. 
That conversation was painful to listen to, let alone see in person. Not good seeing how I saw it looked or remembering just how attached to the kid he was. Midoriya Inko is the kid's mother. She remarried with Toshinori a few years ago and changed her name. They should be here shortly, and she will be protected, I assure you. Aizawa huffed and carted a hand through his hair, carelessly pulling it out of the futile style with a hiss sigh. Yamada put a careful hand on his shoulder. The man jumped, turned, and accepted the hug that Yamada pulled him into. Suguchi left the office to wait for his friend, check on the officers already scanning through files, and give the two their moments of peace. Izuku was greeted outside the elevator when it stopped on the fourth floor. Two men and stepped inside, blocked the door, one with a hardening quirk, and the other with some kind of strength quirk, if his broadened shoulders and his arms had any hint. One of them pressed the button to the fifth floor, and the doors closed and they went down. The other guy half turned to Izuku and glared him down. Izuku matched with a neutral face. He knew this was his warm greeting party. Izashi wasn't an entire idiot. The doors opened after the elevator jolted to a stop. Izuku had no time to duck out and bolt for the elevator on the other side of the complex. If he tried, he could do it. He could face Hizashi first and maybe get a good kick in before he died. He knew these halls better than anyone. His arms were seized, one by each man, and he was dragged out the elevator. Izuku dug his heels into the ground to try to keep them from moving him forward. Let me go, he hissed with a plume of smoke to follow. He could accept that he had walked into death when he came back, but he at least wanted to walk himself into it instead of being dragged with like a human trash bag. Halfway down the hall, Izuku spotted Yukio leaning on the wall, tossing a tiny black thing up and down in one hand. The tiny thing was a thin black rectangle, and what looked like prongs sticking out of one of the flat faces. Her eyes locked on Izuku once the men stopped walking, holding him a solid inch off of the ground by his arms like he was some middle knot in a tug-of-war rope. Yukio walked up to them, threateningly slow, with her tail switching from side to side and her heels clicking. She looked more like an angry cat than she did a lizard. In a fluid motion, she had tossed the box up, caught it with her palm prongs up, and jammed it into the side of Izuku's neck. He gagged, choked. Something was stabbed into his neck, and he couldn't claw and remove it with his arms restrained. "'You'll be the first for our contact suppressant,' Yukio hissed before turning on her heel and walking off, the men following along behind her. Izuku's smoke was getting darker in color, yet less and less came with each breath. He could feel the ache in his chest subsiding, leaving his feeling cold for the first time in a long time. There was an ache in his bones without elemental stress. He was able to feel the removed weight Lightfoot caused. The change in pain level made him panic more. His smoke was all but gone in minutes. He tried to pull at the air around his fingers, change the pressure, push someone, anyone aside, make a breeze, anything. Nothing happened. His quirks weren't working. Of all the times he wished he was quirkless, this was the worst moment for it to come true. He had the distinct memory of going to the labs for the first time, only instead of walking he was being forced against his will, and instead of going to the labs, he was going towards his inevitable doom. Not much of a difference now that he compared them. Yukio stopped at a cell block in the back of the facility, one of the soundproofed ones in the section of the hallway that wasn't well lit, making it harder to see through very dim lights. The lights in the cells, however, would be brighter than the regular hallways, making it a jarring adjustment to anyone who wasn't prepared. There was an open door pouring out light that was in the room Izuku was dragged into. There was a seat in the middle bolted to the ground facing only the door. It had a back that only reached the middle of Izuku's, leaving most of his shoulders exposed, and he was forced into it and strapped down, a strap at his wrists and his elbow, two on his ankle and under his knee, one more wrapped at his waist and connected to the back of the chair, keeping him down. He wouldn't be able to move at all. In the corner by the door was a cart covered in tools. What kind? Izuku didn't know, and he couldn't see that well. It couldn't be good, though. He pulled uselessly at the straps, more restraints than he'd ever been in before. His arms wouldn't move an inch. He was completely immobilized, an animal in a bear trap waiting for the gun. He expected all of this, maybe on a lesser scale, and... He was still panicking. One of the men, both, stood behind the chair, in case Izuku pulled some sort of magic and got out, hit him over the back of the head and told him to shut up. Yukio stood with her arms crossed in the blocking doorway, glaring Izuku down from across the room. He did his best to glare back. 
Hisashi walked in after a long time, with a folding chair under one arm and Korra following behind. The chair was set up in front of Izuku and Hisashi took the seat, legs crossed like he was making a business deal, and a hand out to silently ask for something. Korra dropped a long rectangular box covered in buttons onto his hand. He moved it between his hands and said nothing as he looked the box over. He set the box in his lap after a moment, and finally looked up at Izuku, a smile on his face, the type of smile that looked cheeky and inviting to anyone who didn't know who this was. The anger, disgust, and well-managed rage hidden behind it had Izuku frozen in his own terror. "'Izuku, my son, how are you? I haven't seen you since this morning. How has your day gone?' When Izuku didn't answer, Hizashi continued, "'Do you know why you're here?' Izuku kept his mouth shut. If he stayed quiet, this would draw it out longer, buy more time for whatever Aizawa was doing with the heroes, keep the I'm-not-being-tortured-yet period of time going for however long he could manage. That and he was unsure which questions Hisashi asked were actually questions and not rhetoric. He was never really clear on that subject. Hisashi's smile didn't change, but somehow got more menacing the longer Izuku didn't answer. Izuku, Hisashi hissed, and Izuku immediately shook his head. There was a tisk sound coming from Hisashi's smile replaced by completely an almost tangible form of disgust. He held the long box up and picked something out of the back of it, holding it up for Korra to take. It was a smaller box, not unlike the one Yukio stabbed him with. Korra then stabbed it into the empty side of his neck and backed away. Izuku didn't get a chance to curse as Hisashi clicked something on the box. His body seized and his jaw tightened. Every muscle in his body felt sharp and stung, pulled tight enough that it could snap like peanut brittle. It stopped, only a moment later, but it felt like eternity, and he slumped forward as much as he was able to, gasping for the breath that he didn't realize he lost. Anger roared in Hisashi's eyes. You stole from me. You stole information that could damn well ruin the entire organization if put in the wrong hands. And what did you do with it? Hisuka knew he should have answered, but... It was a question he automatically registered as don't, at least until another surged proved he was wrong. What did you do with it, Izuku? Izuku's throat was dry, and it hurt to even speak with, but he rasped out a simple, gave it away. Hisashi's eyes burned into Izuku's skin. If looks could kill, Izuku would be six feet under a dozen times by now. You what? It was a slow, low hiss of a question, as if he couldn't process what Izuku's answer was, but needed to answer anyways. Hisashi was burying his annoyance and disbelief in the short snap, and Izuku looked up as Hisashi, and something in him just snapped, giving him just a moment of cocky confidence, ignoring the crack in his throat as he did. I took your files, and my notes, and I gave it to Hirayama Masato. I told him to run to his bosses with it. Izuku leaned as far forward as he could to level his best snarl at his father. The dire is going to crumble, and you will all burn in hell. There was silence and stillness, eyes trained on him in almost comical shock. Then Hisashi's face turned cold. Korra, send agents to retrieve Inko. No one moved. Now! Hisashi's roar snapped Korra from her trance, and she hurried out the room. Hisashi stood up from his chair, eyes bright with fire in his throat, contrasting the dark smoke that poured out of his mouth. "'You betrayed me.' Hisuka didn't do anything but glare upwards and bare his teeth. "'For what? That rat isn't going to do anything. Moles tend to be cowards. He won't get far.' Smoke clouded around Izuku's feet as Hisashi spoke, and Izuku coughed and hissed back. "'Then you don't know what a hero can do.' Hisashi laughed. It was bittersweet and chilled Izuku to the very bone. Don't I? He huffed. Izuku, you realize you broke our deal, right? Hisashi's breath was hot as he leaned down and put a hand on Izuku's shoulder, eyes level. In a second that hand was gripping his hair and pulling upwards. The only thing keeping Izuku in the chair was the unforgiving restraints which dug into his skin. Hisashi had a snarl on his face. It wasn't the first time Izuku had seen him angry enough to be physical, but... It was the first time it was solely turned to him. You've just made the biggest mistake of your useless life. I don't care how much time those idiots put into your development or how successful your tests were. I don't care for your talents or a rank as a killer. You've become worthless to everyone. Fire shot past the left side of his neck, just under the pinch of the shocking box, burning the bandages and the scar that was already there, making it roar with a new wave of pain. 
It felt warm. His neck was growing increasingly warm. Was it bleeding? Nothing new, Izuku hissed out anyways, and Izashi barked a laugh again, and Izuku got his hair pulled even more, making him hiss. Here's what I'm going to do, son, Izashi started, standing up straight but not letting go. Yukio will keep you company, while I'm going to go greet your mother, and I'm going to hurt her. I will drag her in here at the very end and make you watch as I kill her. I'll make you wish you were dead once she's gone. We'll play this like every other traitor has. When it comes time for you to die, I'll make you regret every single moment of your disgusting existence. Am I understood? Izuku narrowed his eyes and hissed, I'd like to see you fucking try and hurt her, you fucking bastard. And fire bloomed over Izuku's chest. The front of his hoodie and his turtleneck were gone, skin burning in their place. Izashi let his hair go as Izuku screeched. Huffing smoke, he turned on his heel and stalked out of the room proactively slamming the electric box into Yukio's chest before leaving, shouting something Izuku didn't hear as he walked away from the cell in an angry rage. Yukio stared after him for a moment, before looking directly at Izuku, who was breathing heavy and staring her down. A rage burned behind her eyes as she waved her hand for the two men to leave. They hurried out of the room and let the doors close behind them. Yukio didn't smile. The only time Izuku had ever seen her even crack a smirk was while she was fighting— inflicting as much pain as possible until her target was dead, and she moved to the next task or execution. Even her smirk was terrifying. Right now, Yukio had a smile as wide as the Cheshire Cat and three times more scathing. All right, everyone, this concludes Chapter 7 of Research to Rescue. Chapter 8 will be next, and as always, thank you all so much for listening.